This is Reality Dispatch, written by Jim Mintz. Her leg moved, awakening her senses. The dream was over. Her blanket was thick and heavy, and she didn't adjust herself an inch in the hope that the stillness in her body had a chance of returning to slumber. There was a warm patch of light heating the top of her head. She assumed it was the sun piercing through a crack between the window and curtain. She opened her lids, but the left one was sealed tight, glued down with a crust that felt as if it had dried weeks ago. Perhaps it had. She gave it a rub, but still, it wouldn't break. She forced the blanket from her legs. It took a couple of attempts. Her legs were so weak. She slid them off the bed, put her weight on them, and collapsed to the floor. She yelled out for mum. No response. She began to cry. The enclosed eye was frightening her, and her bladder felt compressed to overflowing. It was a long sleep, and waking from it was daunting. With her one good eye, she looked over to the other bed that shared the room. Under the blankets from her view on the floor, she could see the outline of her younger brother. She crawled over and pulled herself up to face him. His eyes lay unmoved in a deep sleep. Jack, she jostled him. Nothing. Jack. The boy lay still and immobile. She was relieved to see the faint rise and fall of his chest. She crawled out of the bedroom and down the hall to the bathroom. She wanted to see mum and dad, but her desire for relief was strong. As she sat on the cold porcelain, she continued to rub her left eye for some light to pour in. When she was done, she was able to stand properly, and so she faced the mirror. She turned on the hot water and bent down to let the liquid pour over her closed eye. When the seal had broken and the crust became loose, she rubbed water all over her face. She rose to look at herself. She was taller. I'm not nine anymore. Her memory of her hair was just below her earlobes but was now well past her neckline. Mom! She yelled into the hall and heard her voice echo up to her parents' bedroom. She put her mouth under the tap and took a long drink. She hoped she would find her mother in the kitchen, listening to the radio and drinking a coffee. She walked over to her parents' bedroom and was disappointed as she saw them lying motionless beneath their blankets. She got in the bed and curled into a ball in the groove of her father. He didn't move, nor acknowledge her. Dad, she said. She nuzzled her body, but he did not respond. She crawled over the top of him to Mum, who was facing the opposite wall. Mum, she said as she moved her shoulders for a response. Both parents felt cold. She looked at their chests for signs of breathing, but they were turned on their sides and it was difficult to see. A cloud of loneliness engulfed her heart and spread across her body. She did not want to be the first one awake. I don't think you will be, honey, her dad explained. We're all having the same dose. The government says we should all wake on the same day. All four of them stood in the kitchen wearing their pajamas. Dad administered the tablets for himself and Mum. Mum measured the dosage from the liquid that came in the mail. They each had a glass of water. It was only 4.30 in the afternoon, but the effects of the medicine would take around five hours to kick in. After such time, those who received a dose could expect to be unconscious for 13 months, and it was better to be in bed and comfortable when this happened. The government had issued two capsules of HB28 for those 16 years and over, and a liquid that could be dispensed via oral syringe for the younger ones. What if it tastes gross? The boy asked as his mother held five milliliters in a syringe up to his mouth. Wash it down with the water, she explained. But dad, the girl complained as he popped the two tablets in his mouth. I don't want to be asleep for a year. I'll miss my birthday. No, you won't. You won't even notice, darling, he assured her. We'll celebrate extra when we wake up, he smiled. Mum held the syringe up to the girl who felt her heart racing. Swallow, darling, swallow, she encouraged as the girl gulped and chased the dose with a guzzle of water. When they were done, both parents picked up a child and carried them off to bed. What if people don't take the tablets, the girl asked as dad placed her down on the bed. It's in the water, so it doesn't matter. But what about people who aren't in their pajamas? What if they fall asleep in the street? It's okay. When I left work today, there was no one on the street. Everyone had headed home for the big sleep. But what about homeless people? The government has given them beds. They're fine. 
The girl looked at him skeptically. I'm serious, I swear, the man reassured her. He kissed her on the forehead and headed over to the boy. Dad, wait. He sat back down and looked her in the eye. What if we wake up and the disease is still around? It won't be. How do you know? Because it can't survive without people around. But what if we get it in our sleep? We won't. How do you know? Because we won't be exposed to anyone who has it. But, Dad held her hand. Darling, when we wake up, it will be a whole year from now and diseases just can't last that long without infecting people. By the time we all wake up, it will have gone and we can get on with our lives. It's better this way. Why is it better? Because no lockdowns, no restrictions. We just go to sleep and when we wake up, the world is back to normal. He stood up to kiss the boy. As mom and dad stood by the light switch, they looked them over. We'll see you in a year, mom said with a laugh. Are you sure we will wake up together? The girl asked. I'm sure, dad said. But what if I wake up first? You won't? The light went out. She went to the kitchen and was met with four empty glasses. It was hot in the house and she wondered about the time. It could be mid-afternoon. She was hungry and she grabbed a bowl from the cupboard and pulled the chocolate bud cereal from the back of the pantry. She knew Mum would approve given the circumstances. She opened the fridge and the light didn't turn on. There was a strong smell from inside. She went back to the cupboard and was relieved to find long life milk unopened. She sat at the kitchen bench and munched on her breakfast while scrolling for life on the TV. Each click of the remote revealed channel after channel of static. After clicking through 97 stations, she was once more alone with her thoughts. The heat of the house made her uncomfortable as sweat was streaming down the back of her leg. When she went to sleep, it was winter, so it stands to reason that after a year, it should still be winter, except it had to be 40 degrees outside. She found her mum's phone on a charge in the kitchen and took it to her bedroom. She switched it on and sat cross-legged. The battery had remained charged despite its lack of use. When it was ready, she attempted a search, but the fault screen kept telling her there was no connection. The question of which month it was remained unanswered. She passed the time looking through the endless photo roll Mum had amassed over the last nine years. She watched as the details of her birth, infancy, and maturity to childhood were demoted with the arrival of her brother, who became the focus of the lens. She blocked out her relegation by concentrating solely on the years she spent with mom and dad, just the three of them. She felt salty tears down her cheeks and was aware of how quiet the house was with her cries broadcasting loudly. She wondered if she could be heard from the street. How early did I wake? She put the phone down on her bed as it played a video of her first birthday where she was surrounded by her late grandparents singing to her and smothering her cheeks with kisses. Her mother's voice snorted back tears of happiness as she filmed. The girl went to the front door and opened the latches. The top lock would not budge as her dad had locked it with the key for the long sleep. Aligning the hallway next to the front door was the buffet drawer. She opened it and rummaged her hand along the knickknacks for the key ring. She found it amongst an old set of Ray-Bans that were destroyed by an incident involving kinetic sand. She inserted the key into the top lock and squeaked the latch until it unlocked the front door and looked out over the streetscape. The house was positioned high at the end of the cul-de-sac. They lived in a quiet street, although their proximity to the highway, two streets away, connected their suburb to the city and was always roaring with life, especially in the evenings when heavier vehicles favored those roads. On this day, there was nothing but a noticeable silence. The wind did not raise its voice for fear of being discovered. She cleared her throat and held her breath at the percussive volume it let out over the street. What about the dogs? She wondered. She wanted a reaction from Pizza or Mario, the German shepherds that Keith and Jana owned at number 47. She could not remember a time during the daylight when one of them wasn't barking for something or at someone. She let out her deep breath with a scream that echoed off the houses beyond. The dogs would not stand for such an interruption to the quaintness of the neighborhood. However, the scream was met with more silence. If the canines were awake, they weren't at home. The dogs are sleeping too? 
She stepped back inside and closed the door with a thud. Just as the latch hit the lock, a distant yell emerged from the horizon. A jolt pounded her heart, followed by a swell of anxiety in the pit of her belly. She wondered if she was imagining the terrible sound as a byproduct of her reckless slam. She placed her hand on the latch to unlock the door once more and scanned the threat in the hopes that it was not there. Her fears were confirmed as a second voice called out in a blood-curdling scream, a force of evil out in the distance. Her hand turned the lock and she pulled the key out of the latch. She twisted all the knobs to make sure they were fastened before placing the key back inside the buffet drawer. At her chest height was a letterbox slot. She went down on her knees and lifted the flap to look out over the road. Her view was obscured by the railings of the balcony, but that didn't stop her from watching. Her breathing was rapid, and she wondered whether this would give away her presence. Another scream mimicked her own, and it was coming from the top of the street. The voice was laughing with another as they made their way down the bitumen towards her house. She could not see them yet, but with every footstep she heard, they were getting closer. Mom! A croaky voice called from behind. Her eyes widened. Mom! She knew it was her brother, waking from the long sleep. She knew he would get louder until Mum came to see him. She let go of the letterbox flap and turned down the hall, but was frightened by the loud clunk of the galvanized steel. She hoped they didn't hear it. She ran to the bedroom as he kept calling out. When she arrived, she knelt beside his bed. Jack, Jack, it's me, she said in a whisper. I want Mum, he yelled. Shh! She placed a palm over his mouth and he started weeping. He fought her, but she pressed down. His eyes were closed and she didn't know whether he was still sleeping. Jack, please. Mummy, laughs. You hear that? The voices outside were close. They had heard Jack. They mimicked his cries. Jack opened his eyes and looked at his sister. She had a sharp index finger pressed to her lips. She removed her hand and freed his mouth. Where's mum? He asked. Still asleep, she whispered. Jack started to weep once more. He let out a loud cry. As Jack inhaled to let out another yell, a hand came in and scooped up the girl from the foot of his bed and dove in with her under Jack's covers. The arms held both children tight and kissed the head of Jack's hair until he was calm. Their mother lay with them under the safety of the blanket. She caressed the hair above both of their ears. When it was too hot to breathe, she lifted the fabric slightly above their noses so that they were still protected. We have to be quiet until they are gone, she whispered. The girl squeezed her mother back as tight, thankful for her presence. Jack understood the seriousness of what Mum was saying and kept still and quiet. They had all dozed off as they lay there waiting for the unknown voices outside to vanish. When they woke up, it was collective and the day had become night. Mummy, Jack whispered. Yes, darling? I'm seven now. She smiled and kissed him on the head. The girl could see tears in her mother's eyes, but was reminded of the voices so didn't dare to speak. I think we can get up now, Mum said. Is it safe? The girl whispered. I don't know, Mum said. I hope so. For more stories of fact-based fiction, head to jimmins.substack.com.